Hello and welcome to our webinar, How Real-Time Visualization Helps Keep Clients Happy. Uh, this is a webinar that has me particularly excited. We're going to be showing some work that is truly exceptional from friend Ted Vitale from Voxel Design. Really just fantastic work. My name is Roderick Bates. I'm the head of integrated practice here at Enscape. And I would like to uh, just make a quick note on questions as we dive into the presentation. If you have any questions, and I certainly hope you do, there's a lot here that's really gonna stir your imagination and make you think a little bit harder about how you present visualizations to your clients, uh, please enter them in through the question interface in the GoToWebinar uh, panel. Uh, we'll be having plenty of time to address them near the end. And uh, it's a rare opportunity to get to talk to someone like Ted. So with that, let's get into it. So, as I said, uh, my name is Roderick Bates, and I'm the head of integrated practice here at Enscape. Um, and it's an unusual title, but it's a really great position that I have here. And one of its primary responsibilities is to understand the needs of our customers and how to incorporate those needs into our product roadmap in the long term. So, um, getting to speak to users like Ted and Voxel Design is a really fantastic way for us to understand some of the challenges and opportunities that we have to, to further improve our software. So I always like to start with some of the, the ways that we at Enscape really like to think about ourselves. And first and foremost, we're industry driven. And, and maybe that sounds like a, a little bit of jargon, but it's absolutely true. Uh, we are fully dedicated to understanding the challenges that our users face and essentially how to solve them, simply put. And so that really requires an in-depth understanding of the design process and really tracking how our software is used throughout all phases of design. And part of that is that we wanna be that mission critical software. We wanna be the software that is the way in your design process that you, that you communicate your designs and with that a complete understanding of design to everyone that's involved in the design process. Uh, we feel it's incredibly important that design is truly a collaborative process. And we feel that visualization is, is really the way in which you can uh, fulfill that collaborative vision. So what does that mean in practice? What does that mean from a conceptual level? And I'd like to look at things as sort of the pre-Enscape era, if you will, where visualization was absolutely an important part of the design process. Uh, but visualization really happens separately from the design process itself. And what we feel we've been able to do for our users with Enscape is integrate the capacity to both visualize and design through one workflow track. Uh, we think it's a, an incredibly effective tool and it's, it's a way in which essentially you're able to use visualization as a design tool as opposed to this fragmented communication mechanism. So when we think about the types of communication that people are engaging in, one of the things that we realize is that a lot of that communication revolves around design decisions. It's how do we communicate the necessary information for all the stakeholders at the table, whether they be contractors, um, clients, uh, maybe people just within the architectural design team. How are they able to get all the information they need to make a design decision? And one of the things that we feel is incredibly powerful is that visual communication enabled through real-time visualization is one of the greatest ways to let everyone have that, that full ecosystem of information at hand when they make design decisions. So I'll run through some examples of that, but I think one of the most important ways to think about how you get everyone on the same page, and, and from my perspective, that's really about having an inclusive design process a process where everyone has the information they need to make decisions is really through having um, an understanding. And if you look at this particular slide, you'll, you'll see some of the traditional ways that architecture has been communicated during the design phase. You know, you have elevation drawings that can be incredibly effective for those that are trained perhaps to interpret that type of information. But for those that aren't, 
um, it's very challenging to understand exactly what they're looking at and because of that actually make decisions. And so that's one of the ways that we feel that visualization that includes motion, immersive environments, you know, rendering to start to look a lot more like the real world um, is an incredibly effective way of really making the design process inclusive, putting everyone on that same page when it comes to understanding the design and then with that be able to make collaborative and effective decisions. So what does this look like throughout the design process? What is some of the roles of visualization? And that, I think for us, it's important to always remember that any project starts with, as we like to say, winning the work. And visualization at that phase needs to be done incredibly quickly. Um, it needs to be one in which you're rapidly iterating ideas. And that's one of the places where we feel Enscape's incredibly effective. It's a lightweight tool. It um, integrates across a broad variety of CAD platforms. Um, some of them, like Rhino, are really great for rapid iteration. And it allows for the creation of diagrams, views, um, different concepts that can be rapidly shared with a broad variety of people. And when we look at something like, say, schematic design, things start to get a little bit more sophisticated. Um, maybe we're starting to bring a higher level of resolution to the design, but we're also starting to be concerned about other types of challenges, like how does a design actually flow? Um, what are some of the, the mechanisms by which one might experience the space that they're in? So it's not just working on that very conceptual level. And this is where these types of immersive environments allow people to navigate space in a way that they can really understand is incredibly important. In design development, we start to put a little bit more of the meat on the bone. And one of the challenges that we often find is that traditionally, in, in the context of, say, the BIM model that people might be using, you know, there's data is there, but it can be hard to interpret. Uh, so if you look at, say, maybe the rendering possibilities that are, are that you can execute in the context of some of these platforms, you know, the, the quality is better, it's a little bit more visually legible, but it really doesn't excite the imagination in quite the right ways. But then we look at something like this, a real-time render um, created here in Enscape. And you can see the dramatic improvement in visual quality and also the opportunity for rapid viewing and selecting of various design options. Um, this is something that we feel is incredibly powerful and really shrinks that decision-making timeline down significantly because the person has all the visual information they need at hand to make a decision. So as we move into construction, there's still really an important role for visualization. One of the things that we found is that as teams start to work across trades, the communication and the need for communication uh, doesn't go away. I mean, obviously, people that are, are building buildings really know what they're doing. But at the same time, they're used to working off of traditional 2D plans. And a lot of our customers are finding that if they integrate one of the, the little barcodes that you can export from Enscape, takes you to some of that web content that they've previously generated, and allows for a view of what that particular space is actually supposed to look like once it's complete. And so by combining that sort of more intuitive visualization with the actual plan that's used for documentation, that drawing set, you can create a, a complete understanding that really closes the gap between, say, um, what is documented and what needs to be built. So that's a little bit of an intro uh, to Enscape, um, but really I think this is the part that has me so excited. Um, so with that, I would like to hand over the, uh, the screen, so to speak, to Ted Fitali with Voxel Vision. Um, he does some fantastic work, really high-end work, and uh, it's something that uh, it's a rare treat to get to talk to a customer that pushes Enscape the way that Ted does. All right. Thanks very much, Roderick, for the intro and uh, the nice um, uh, kind of outline of what we're going to be talking about today. I think, um, you know, Roderick touched on a few of the points that we're going to go in depth about uh, this uh, this afternoon on you know, winning that work and really making the client happy. Uh, so a little bit about me and Voxel Vision as a whole uh, before we get into the thick of it. Um, you know, I started Voxel Vision a few years ago now. Uh, we focus on uh, visual marketing content for real estate developers, uh, designers, and uh, builders. Um, our goal is to do architecture that excites us and interests us and push the boundaries of what we can do with a project uh, and do it in a fun, kind of interesting way. 
Uh, our office is here in Baltimore. Uh, I founded it in 2018 with uh, my partner, Austin, uh, who is our technical lead and kind of the go-to guy whenever there are coding things that we're not doing or that we need to do that I don't want to do. Um, and then we also added Marcus uh, Spratley a few years ago uh, as a team member, and he is quickly coming up the ranks as a an artist uh, and uh, really helps the office. So that's our office here in Baltimore. And then we also have a team outside of the office that helps us on a regular basis uh, in Miami, Virginia, uh, the UK, and Mexico. Um, and between the teams here and offsite, uh, we can generate some really fun, interesting content uh, using primarily Enscape. Uh, everything you're going to be seeing here today that I'm talking about was uh, designed and built inside of Enscape. Uh, and the goal of this presentation is to kind of talk you through our process, uh, how we focus on uh, what it is we do, and how we develop these kinds of uh, digital doubles, if you will, for architecture. Now, our focus today is going to be on high-end luxury uh, residential. Uh, so very large LA-based houses in the uh, 8 to 15,000 square feet range, um, you know, dealing with budgets in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, we also work on commercial mixed use uh, and uh, a number of different types of projects, but today that's kind of going to be our focus on uh, interior design and engaging the clients so that you can make uh, design validation conversations uh, an interesting kind of cyclical design process. So getting into it, um, you know, while the majority of the users that are probably in this conversation right now in the chat viewing this, um, uh, this webinar, you are probably working inside of BIM, uh, either Revit, Archicad, SketchUp, or Rhino. Um, but the majority of architects out there, and this is kind of surprising to say, are all still working in a traditional flat plan and elevation approach. Uh, what we have found over and over again is that methodology is great for us as designers, but terrible for clients. Um, they don't read plans in most cases, and when they do, um, there's still a lot uh, that can be lost in interpretation when you're dealing in only 2D. So we are exploring today BIM visualization and how the client is evolving to expect more um, and how you keep that client engaged in design iteration and cyclical design uh, to make the best possible product. So uh, with that said, why are these things changing and how? Like what, what is the ethos of most firms these days and how do they leverage their 3D to keep clients happy and um, take those, uh, you know, 2D plans to 3D and 3D plans to the client. Um, like I said, clients' expectations are changing. Uh, many want to see realistic renderings uh, throughout the process, and Roderick touched on a few things during the SD and DD phases. Enscape is really helping um, evolve that conversation. Uh, but I don't see as many architects leveraging that as I think need to be, um, which is kind of how our office uh, steps in and effectively manages uh, as a communication tool between the client and the designer. Um, but you know, we're going to talk about why client expectations are changing, how that visualization in real time is not, um, how that real time uh, visualization helps. Uh, win that work, but also retain it. Um, the benefits uh, that come from that inclusive design and the long-term cost savings that will inevitably come from using uh, a process like this. Um, so just because you have the visual conceptual design in your head doesn't necessarily mean that it translates well to the client. Um, we all, and by we, all of the designers and artists in this conversation right now, 
um, I assume we are all trained to read 2D plans, like Roderick was showing. Um, the layperson doesn't. They understand the world spatially. X, Y, Z doesn't mean anything to them. They only understand it in the sense that I have this level of depth between myself and something else. Um, so it's difficult to communicate that depth and that design language through 2D elements um, and get them to extrapolate that depth from that limited spatial information. So typically there's a little bit of hand-holding that happens during these processes with uh, the client, and sometimes that's your homeowner, um, but that's also commercial spaces as well. I'm seeing this more and more that design is starting to happen during the rendering phase uh, versus during the design phase. And I see this more often than not because those early conversations with the client have not happened until the renderings are generated and they go, hmm, I don't know about that anymore. Um, so sometimes, again, design intent isn't always translated to execution. And this is why rendering early and illustrating early is important. So uh, now to talk a little bit more about why these client expectations are changing, um, you know, we've got 3D becoming more and more ubiquitous. Uh, on a regular basis, I'm seeing um, TV, video games, uh, movies, everybody knows 3D, everybody recognizes CGI when they see it now. Um, it's important to have these three-dimensional elements when you are communicating your design. Um, and as VR becomes more mainstream and you have these shows that are incorporating uh, 3D as a standard part of the you know, visual communication process, you're going to have clients asking for more than just your BIM model. Again, going back to what Roderick was showing earlier with the BIM uh, presentation, of the space, you can see a stark contrast between a 3D BIM element and a 3D rendered element. Um, and it's very important to have those conversations early and talk about what that actual space will look like. Um, so now, how do we go from something like this to something like this? That's, that's the big question today. Um, how do we make these visuals uh, feel realistic enough to have some of these conversations. And I'm not gonna lie, it's a process. There's a lot that goes into this. Um, and BIM is a big piece of that puzzle. Your Archicad, your Revit, your SketchUp, your Rhino, those are all important tools. But if you're only showing that tool, uh, there's a disconnect that happens. Um, it's great for documentation and communicates design intent to builders really well, but it doesn't necessarily communicate that same design intent to the layperson, the homeowner, the client. So that's where our company kind of steps in and acts as the middleman. We say, okay, hi designer, nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Ted, I'm gonna take your design and generate something tangible from it so that you have a better conversation with your client. Um, this typically uh, occurs after the big passes have gone through and, you know, after the broad strokes have gone through and, and built that footprint in and said, this is this thing and that is that thing. Um, typically, it happens before um, or after uh, the DD set is presented and approved, but... Um, maybe before construction documentation is completed. So we're somewhere in between uh, maybe a 10% set, uh, permitting set, somewhere in there. That's where we step in and say, okay, this 3D thing that you have that might look like this is not translating well to the client. You have approval from the city, you have approval you know, from the client that this is the kind of thing that I want, but it's arguably ugly. The layperson doesn't understand what the, these materials mean. Um, and it's generally portrayed as kind of unrealistic. So how do we take something like that, that is a BIM model uh, with lots of great documentation information um, and turn it into something that communicates design? Um, and that's 
you know, the important part is how do we go from point A to point B? Uh, and one of the things that I talk about in I'm going to talk about in a little bit more depth as we get on into this is, you know, coming in at the right time. We want to come in, like I said, somewhere during the uh, late design documentation, early construction documentation uh, area when most of the design decisions have been made because we don't want to um, create what I call the doorknob effect. Uh, and that is something that happens, and I call it the doorknob effect because we had a client do this. It happens when you show a client something too detailed too early in the process, and they end up focusing only on a placeholder element that isn't important to the overall process or project, and it ends up derailing the entire design conversation. Um, the reason I call this the doorknob effect is we had a client, this is going back about 12 years ago now, who we did these really wonderful renderings of the lobby space, and they could only focus on one door pull, one doorknob that they absolutely hated and it derailed the entire conversation and caused all kinds of problems. So finding that Goldilocks zone during the early to mid CD phase is so important and getting in there and communicating the more detailed nuances of the project uh, at that stage to allow some of the more uh, detailed design oriented uh, conversations to happen when they can happen so that it doesn't cause a change order or um, a, a problem during construction. Uh, so we take that BIM model and we start to develop our final models from it. Um, so from start to finish, we're gonna take a look at three projects, um, Lacumbre, Napoli, and Oceana. Uh, Oceana is built. Uh, Napoli is 90% uh, complete and will be listed soon. And Le Cumbre is a privately uh, run project uh, that is in development. And we'll talk about kind of the different stages of what that development looks like and why we use these three models as kind of our examples. Um, with most, most projects, like I said, we get that rough BIM model. Uh, in the mid to late stages, uh, and that's when we start adding the elements that the client actually wants to see. Um, detailed materials, actual FF&E, um, assets that they are going to be seeing in real life, and we will model those things in the project and take it from a very, <clears throat> excuse me, a very simple kind of rudimentary model to you know with no guts inside that says this is a pool this is a space that doesn't really communicate what the design intent is to a fully fleshed out 3d model uh down to the specific windows uh specified these specific light fixtures um in this case solar array uh and materials so we go from what they have to what they will have uh, you know, so um, by combining these BIM models with a more advanced visualization tool like Enscape, we can then start to see the the one to one digital double of the project become uh, more effective in a, as a communication tool, winning more work, keeping your clients happy, um, you know, and allowing your BIM tools to not miss things and um, visualize every element. So what does this typically lead to? This typically leads to uh, validating uh, your project earlier, uh, creating better client engagement, uh, generating faster design approval, and lowering the production costs uh, with less waste because you're not making those change orders later on in the process. Um, I have lots of examples of uh, work paying for itself. Typically, tools like Revit and Archihad have clash detection, but that's only helpful if you're using those tools. Uh, we found in one instance that you know we saved the client a good deal of money because we found a conflict when we were modeling from their 2D plans uh, in you know their stairwell. 
but it led to a new conversation about, well, what does that stairwell actually look like? If we have to redesign it anyways, how is that going to happen? And it allowed us to iterate through a few different design options with the client, with the client's team, um, and go through those design options in a, an educated way so that the end result was better. Um, they ended up not using any of these. They omitted the stair altogether, but they had the conversation early so that they could um, have an effective, you know, an effective conversation about what it was that was wrong and how to fix it. Um, this could have been a very costly change. And we see a lot of these kind of costly changes uh, happen with just material type design elements. Um, when you're talking about projects like these, uh, even a bar or a floor material change later in the stages of the project will end up costing tens of thousands of dollars, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars in change orders. Um, so when your budget increases, uh, these kinds of design validation tools are going to save the client money and it's going to save you headache. Um, so design, validate, iterate. And that is just kind of the, the goal. And by doing it through real time, you get a much better sense of the space as a whole. Um, so going back to Napoli and progressing some of these models, when we communicate to a client uh, from their BIM model, we will use it, usually pull it in. Um, we're going to look at a partially developed project. Let me go ahead and put full screen there. So um, this particular project was done fully in Enscape with SketchUp. Uh, we pulled the Revit model in from um, the client and we cleaned it up, prepped it, and started developing lighting materials and uh, content based on what the client gave us. Um, this first pass is to get the bones in to make sure that the lighting is accurate to what is specified, make sure the materials are there, um, and now we can start to have design conversations about what these spaces are going to end up looking like. Um, once we had this in, we had the designers sit down with us and kind of go through space by space and say, we want to change this, we want to evolve that, and we want to make all of these different iterations on what we currently have. Um, generally, these elements or these models give us a good sense of space, but they're not the complete picture. And the goal is to evolve this even further and I'm, we're not going to watch through all 10 minutes of this, uh, but we can quickly see kind of the different elements in the basement. Um, you know, this is their wine cellar. Many of these projects have these very elaborate spaces. Uh, their sauna, um, gym, and so on and so forth. Uh, but by modeling all these things and having them ready and uh, available for the client to review, uh, it allows you to have these conversations earlier, uh, and it eventually leads to a more complete picture of what will be. Now, as we iterated through this, uh, we made design uh, decisions about um, what some of these spaces look like. Uh, at this point, we start staging it, um, you know, being able to visualize the entire uh, space with furnishings and elements that um, are going to be uh, placed. This is a perfect example. If we go uh, and look at, oh, yeah, if we looked at this same room in the previous version, there was an opening to the uh, living room space. They omitted that and wanted to make this a more private office space. Um, and we were able to communicate those design decisions quickly. Uh, over the course of about a week, uh, and then start staging these spaces and adding furnishings and really selling the concept of what this will be. Um, the best part about this is as you evolve these projects, um, when you are walking through and having these conversations with the design team, um, you no longer have to wait for uh, 
uh, marketing material, you have it. You have the marketing material at your fingertips. You just say, I need views of rooms A, B, C, D, and E. All of these are ready to go, uh, and we can um, generate marketing material for any of those spaces at a moment's notice. The client says jump, we say how high, and it's not a big headache to get these things exported and sent back. Um, so in a day, we can turn around uh, two dozen renderings, where in the past, those same uh, renderings would have taken weeks and weeks. Not to say that these don't take weeks of work, but because we're involved in the process early, we can then say to the client, you know, we're not charging you on a per rendering basis, we're charging you on a design square footage basis. And we can have these conversations and build trust with the client and have them really understand the space um, and get them the marketing content they need to sell sooner and, you know, get those buyers to um, come on board at the right point in time. Uh, I believe this project is being marketed now. Uh, there's already uh, some interest in purchasing the house and the goal is to sell the property before uh, construction is complete uh, end of the summer. So uh, with that, I'm going to transfer over to kind of talking about some of the models. And I think that's where a lot of you are going to be wanting to see. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, how the sausage is made. This is what we get from the client. These are not the most uh, glamorous models. If I were to show this to, uh, you know, let's say my wife and I are design, designing a house and we want to see what it looks like. If I were to show this to my wife, the first thing she would ask is, why is it all gray and blue? And why are the plants not interesting? And the colors are weird. And it doesn't look like we expect it to look. And that's the problem with kind of the traditional this is a 3D model, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So what we then need to do is go in and understand based on plan elevation um, and uh, uh, drawings from the architect is, okay, what is this actually going to look like? And we fill in the gaps. So we'll take this model and we will go from this to this, where we now have nearly a one-to-one -one property, uh, digital double of the property, uh, down to uh, architect-specific materials, um, whitewash brick. Uh, these are the specified windows and doors. These lamps are, actually, these are just placeholders. We're waiting on a specification for this lamp, but they said a more Baroque lamp, so we have those in. Wall paneling. These all translate to usable content for the architect to have those conversations. I believe this space, this uh, den bar space that we're looking at right now, this took, I think, four iterations before we got to where the client was happy with what the interior designer was designing. Um, we went through you know, a few different pull styles. We went through a few different color styles. We went through a few different layouts. Um, based on the designer's notes and based on the client's feedback uh, to get to the point of um, a bar that they were happy with. Uh, we also detail out everything upstairs. Uh, you can see our Enscape proxy models in here, our linked models. Um, each of the bathrooms down to the specified tile that they are looking to use. Um, this is where I think the power of Enscape comes into play, is understanding how these materials work uh, and showing those material decisions to the client uh, and getting their approval. You know, we, even a few years ago, I don't think we could have done this in a lot of tools. And here we are, I can tour this entire space with the client in real time and make design changes um on the fly hugely beneficial absolutely valuable and then 
Here, this is the Napoli property that we were just talking about. Um, this is the fully detailed, furnished uh, property that is currently being listed. Uh, I think we're sitting just above 10,000, 11,000 square feet. Um, we can tour every inch of this house and it is detailed. We've got storage, start from the basement. We've got Enscape proxy models, linked models to communicate, you know, the size of the garage. Because a lot of times you will have spaces that aren't visually interesting enough to show a client. No one really wants to see a garage, but if you add a car to the garage, you get a sense of that space. Um, so adding those little elements uh, definitely adds value to the overall project. Um, we've paneled all the walls with their custom paneling, uh, detailed bathrooms. Uh, this particular property has uh, their gym through here. Spa, sauna, and basement bathroom. We have our uh, wine cellar. Uh, we've got specific art that the client wanted to see. Uh, we've got custom uh, assets in the space to show that uh, it's furnished. Um, everything is detailed to the point of I mean, we've got all the doorknobs and handles that are specified in this project. So media viewing room, upstairs, we've got views out to the patio. With these kinds of models, I mean, we're dealing with somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 500 megs to a gig each time. Um, we kind of evolve these, they get bigger. Uh, but we're dealing with something that um, has a lot of detail in it because we want to have those conversations with the client and really discuss what is that view outside going to look like from this particular living room? What does the view look like from the outside dining room? What is it from the kitchen? So having these this level of detail really allows the client to take ownership and understand their space. Again, we've got some proxy models for the bed and linens because we can't show those directly in model all the time. Bathrooms are all detailed. I don't know what this is going to list at, but I believe it's going to be in the 20 to $25 million range when it does list. So these are some very important properties that you want to get right and you don't want to miss you don't want to miss details on you don't want to miss things on these so so that about wraps up my general kind of um uh exploration of each of these models um i think while we're going through these models uh roderick if you want to start with some of the Q&A, I have a feeling we're gonna end up talking a little bit longer as kind of some of the questions come up. Um, and uh, I can continue to discuss some of the details on this and other projects uh, that we're working on. Absolutely. So I think one of the, the interesting things about this that I would want to um, to ask actually is about that that research phase and that client interaction phase in particular. And I'm curious about how you understand what those client tastes are. You know, furnishings are incredibly personal. As you said, you want to avoid that doorknob effect. Mm -hmm. So what does that process look like of collecting information from the clients, whether it be an investor group or it's actually, you know, a particularly well-heeled individual um, to, to make sure that you do have the right assets in your model? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is just a lot of, conversations and our collection process doesn't always reflect what, where we end up. Um, with some of these speculative houses like this one, um, it's a little less about what the client wants and a little bit more about what the listing agent may kind of 
uh, expect to see. And what we will typically do, and I'll pull up another uh, project uh, document for this. Uh, what we will typically do is have that conversation uh, once the details of materials are finished, once the windows are in, when we have all of the um, all the important stuff, the guts done, if you will. Um, once we have that, we will start having those kinds of um, conversations about interior elements. So let's see here. Um, when we start having those conversations, we will typically ask the client to send us examples of other projects that they are working on that they uh, want to see and we'll do iterations on uh, those particular elements. So in this case, we went through, they wanted to see a traditional option and a more modern option. So we gave them both traditional, modern. Um, some of so the other spaces. Real design work here then. There's judgment that you're applying, you know, you're, you're having to interpret. When they say traditional, what does that mean? Exactly. So um, it's a little bit difficult sometimes. You don't know what the client actually wants to see. Uh, so you have to throw some things at them and hope for the best. Uh, They'll always cases. tell you what they don't want um, in my experience. Exactly, so exactly. But what we will typically do is put a few uh, example projects in front of them and say, do you like A or do you like B? And that will give us enough information to start staging um, this sort of conversation. Um, you know, when we are developing these interiors uh, out, uh, I mean, we will have many, many layers. And let's see here. Yeah. We will look at, let's see. I think furniture option A and furniture option B. So we'll have these as proxies, but we'll be able to switch between those two furniture options um, and show the client the different, uh, you know, the different options rendered. Um, so that's the important part and why, you know, having these elements where you've got, you know, the traditional versus the modern, why these are so important when you're having these conversations because you want to sell that house best. Is huge. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, now this is not going to happen immediately. You can't do this necessarily live every time, but you can have some pretty interesting conversations about uh, what these spaces are going to look like, how they're going to look, um, and you know, be able to have these conversations hang on two seconds i'll show all these images i just need to get some slides out because they've got some information that we can't share publicly uh, no problem i i'll uh, hold off on the questions that are coming in pretty quick here so that we actually have some okay. really great engagement from the yeah, audience good, i encourage good. everyone to continue to, to populate the, uh, the question section on the uh, go to webinar interface yeah so um if you want to fire some of those questions over to me, I, I'd be happy to start answering them. Well, it's always good for to hear about different options in the context of software. And, and the renderings you're showing, you know, particularly these, you know, they're really fantastic. The lighting looks great, the materials are, are um, you know, very rich. But people are asking about other types of software. So obviously you mentioned SketchUp and Enscape, but are you also using, say, V-Ray or something else to, you know, for the, the really high quality visual outputs? Yeah, so I mean, it's always a mix of tools. I tell people on a regular basis that um, if you limit yourself to one tool, you're not going to be able to uh, scale with the client and you're not going to be able to meet the client's needs. So we use a mixture of tools. Um, and I would say it's a 90, 10, 80, 20 kind of split where we're 90% Enscape and maybe 10 to 20% other. Um, you know, this is an Enscape conversation, so I don't want to get too into the weeds on other products that we use. Well, we I think it's always good to, to note that there's um, competition out there. It keeps us yeah, um, on our toes. Yeah, absolutely. But we do use Enscape. We do use a little bit of Lumion. We do use a little bit of Corona. Um, and we 
use those tools in conjunction with this. The great part about Enscape is I can have these conversations with the client about furniture uh, and go through so many different iterations so quickly here, I can then hand this off to my team who is working in Max and Corona or Max and V-Ray and say, here's the core model, uh, fully detailed. Here are the assets we were using. Uh, let's look at uh, evolving this design language a little bit further and taking the lighting a little bit further. Um, uh, one of the strong suits of those programs are reflections and one of the weak things in Enscape is reflections. So, you know, if we're in a bathroom and we have two mirrors facing each other and we've got, you know, lots of reflections, we have to move into something. Uh, but when we're dealing with day to day and we're talking about design iteration, there's no tool that allows me to get this level of detail this quickly and this effectively. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite as efficient as Enscape. What's really great about these images too is that I think for the vast majority of users, um, you know, this is this is that 100% solution. And, and I absolutely acknowledge that there's those that have that that have to get something just perfect. But by and large, mm -hmm. it's quite quite remarkable. Uh, but you're also showing. We talked about assets and how uh, people come to you say with their, their particular tastes or and maybe they're quite vague. Uh, but there's some questions about what your sources are for some of those assets. You know, you're showing some remarkable furniture, some of these pictures here. I know the Enscape mm -hmm. has a, a lot of assets as library, but it doesn't have that many. So I'm curious on what your workflow might be for that. Yeah, so um, our workflow with that, uh, we use, I think uh, Enscape just did a really great blog post the other day about asset libraries. And I implore all of you on this chat, if you're looking for assets, go take a look at that blog post because I learned some new locations to find stuff. Um, but our primary source is usually, um, uh, uh, why am I blanking? TurboSquid, uh, tools like, um, uh, I'm so sorry, bear with me here. Uh, tools like TurboSquid, Globe Plants, uh, we'll use for a lot of the furniture, Design Connected is a really valuable asset. Um, we use, um, we'll occasionally get onto 3D Sky. Uh, we find a lot of assets on um, CG. Uh, CG Trader. CG Trader, thank you, thank you. Uh, CG Trader is another great one. So there's lots of locations. Blender has a great marketplace that allows you to download and we'll pull it into Blender, convert it, and send it over to SketchUp. So really it's a multitude of tools to get to this point. Um, so again, don't limit yourself to just one tool set. Um, but yeah, we'll, um, that, that, um, that blog post that uh, you guys did recently was pretty spot on. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we absolutely acknowledge. You know, we have a, custom asset and import workflow. Um, and for those that take advantage of, particularly on projects like this, you know, it's, it's really essential. Um, so how about um, aspects of say like materials and finishes? I mean, you're showing some really wonderful materials here, which makes sense. I mean, that's a big part of, of what makes these houses so fantastic. I mean, is yeah. there a particular tech stack or workflow you have for that? Um, so we use a lot of um, elements from Polygon. Uh, if you're not using Polygon, you should be. It's a great asset. Uh, they've also got some uh, like brick generators and tools for brick generation that become valuable for this. Um, we will also make our own custom assets uh, and materials when we need them. So some of the couches that are in here are um, are from like 3D Sky or uh, or uh, CG Trader or uh, Turbo Squid. But there are also elements that we just can't find online because they are either very high end or just not very popular. So we will have to model those. Um, uh, we will usually use something like Blender for that. And then when it comes to custom materials, uh, I mean, Photoshop is your go-to to start with. You'll find something that works and you'll generate a larger texture from that. Um, and then um, we do, uh, this is where Austin kind of comes in. Uh, he's much better at using tools like Substance and uh, 3D Coat to generate more customized materials. 
Um, but that's usually edge cases when it's a really specific thing that you're not going to find on a polygon or uh, in a 3D asset library somewhere. So and that certainly makes sense. And one of the things I thought that was interesting here is that there are design changes that are happening in response to this visualization. As you said, this is the point at which the client all of a sudden realizes, hey, maybe that's not exactly what I meant or uh, I want something different. Um, you know, what does the workflow look like to get that back into that 2D set? Because uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're not the architect um, in this case, but you know, in, in fact, you're actually playing right. a crucial design decision in that role. Right. So this is where working hand in hand with uh, a design team is really valuable. Um, we've had um, we've had the chance to work with some really really impressive design teams over the last uh, few years. Um, on this particular project that we're looking at now, um, this was a team uh, called Insert Design out in Los Angeles, California. Um, their lead designer and I worked very um, effectively together to make some of these design decisions. And essentially, we would sit down together. Um, I would go through some iterations and she would suggest some iterations that we would explore together. Um, and we would end up landing on something that we think would work. From there, what would end up happening is she would take those uh, kind of rough ideas in the model that we have. We would generate some illustrations for her, some sections if we need it. Uh, she would take those and put them into plan elevation so they would end up back into the construction drawings. And then cyclical design, we would pull those drawings back into our model and make sure our model matched. So because we're not always taking into consideration every structural element, every mechanical element that they might. So by going through those design iterations and then coming back around, uh, we will have a more accurate model because then we will see, okay, they have returns coming in here, they have structure here, we need to model this like that. Um, so we'll so be able to make the design uh, decisions the interface between that model and the client or does it always go back through um, the architect or, or the design firm that hires you we will always you always keep the designer in the loop you never cut the designer out of the loop i want to say that we we are a viz firm that also has some design background um so we can make we can interpolate from the information given and generate something realistic. Um, but we will never take it upon ourselves to design something unless we are asked to. And periodically the designer will say, well, I don't have time to do that. Why don't you guys just throw something in there? Um, and that's when we'll do a little bit of design work, but that still goes back to the interior or the architect. Um, then it will go to the client. So there's always interiors or architecture us, the client, interiors, architecture, us, client. So we always wanna go through that loop in a certain way, that way nothing gets missed. Because if you go backwards and you go design, design, uh, model, and then client, and the client wants to see a change, if you don't loop in the architect or the designer, you're gonna be in trouble at the end. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah, well, um, that goes without saying, it could be a disaster, yeah. honestly. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the questions we're getting actually and a couple of different people are asking this is, is something that I've experienced um, in the context of my past um, life as working in design practice was how do you manage those client requests? Uh, because everyone loves to, as I like to say, play architect. Um, but at the right. same time, you know, these decisions come with costs and nobody likes to say no to a client. So right. I'm curious about, and this maybe this isn't really about visualization, it's maybe just a question about client management. Um, but how do you manage clients and make sure that you're, you're not just confronted with a, a litany of, of potential changes and you're in this very reactive right. mode? How do you make sure that these are constructive conversations? Well, with these projects, we're not on a fixed fee. We are on an hourly fee with some fixed elements in there. If you want, sorry, I got something in my eye. Um, if you want... Um, if you want the kind of rendered marketing material images, those are kind of our fixed fee elements. But all of this is kind of a um, uh, an evolving project. 
based on hours. So from our end, we don't mind making as many changes as you want, as long as you're aware that you're paying for the hours. Now, when it comes to design changes that cost money later on the down the line, as in like we need to VE this, uh, this thing that we've designed out, um, that's a different conversation. That's one that is usually had with the architecture of the interior design team involved. Um, the nice part about these projects is they are less concerned in most cases about sort of the cost of building and more concerned about, hey, I need to get this to look the specific way that I want it to look uh, because that will sell the project. Um, but those conversations just need to be had. If we say, okay, we want the fireplace in the center, um, the conversation immediately was had. They said, we don't want the fireplace there. We want it to be a big open space. Um, what ended up happening was there's a structural beam that runs through the center here. Uh, and the designer and I had the conversation. She said, show it with and then show it without. We'll show both options. And then we will have the conversation about option A with the fireplace is going to be substantially less expensive than option B because we will need to put a very, very large beam across this very long expanse and that will end up costing um, many thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to do. So by having the design in front of the client, they can make the informed decision of, I think the value of having no fireplace there is more important uh, than the cost because it does something for the design. Uh, and in this case, they said, well, I think the fireplace is more valuable for the design uh, and it does double duty by allowing us to put structural elements in the center of the room. Uh, it is not as valuable to us to eliminate that element. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where design validation. We said option A is going to be more expensive than option B. Which of the two options do you feel will give you the ROI, essentially? Uh, which of those two things is going to be more valuable to you as a whole? And that's always a challenge, and it's going to be unique to, to every client. There's no doubt yeah, about it. Yeah, and every so, job. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So one of the questions we had is, is obviously we're having some people that maybe aren't completely familiar with Enscape, but they're asking uh, or about that live connection, in this case with SketchUp or Revit, and that real-time aspect. And just to be clear, as you model within these platforms, in real-time, Enscape generates these, these renders. Um, which is a, a pretty powerful component of, of the software. But I'm actually curious to, to throw that back on you. And I can certainly see the, the value of that in a traditional design workflow. But I'm curious of that real-time aspect. Is that something that, that you find useful in the context of, of your application? Absolutely. Um, one of the best parts about having that real-time uh, isn't so much um, the end result, but the ability to find that perfect view. Um, that's something that you couldn't necessarily do in older products that required more time to render. Um, traditional tools like V-Ray and Corona and ray tracing applications um, take a lot of hardware to do things quickly. Uh, Enscape doesn't take quite as much hardware to do things quickly, which is kind of nice. By, so take, um, just as a warning, you'll find the stats on our website, but yes, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it still does take some time, and you want to have higher quality hardware to do some of the bigger stuff. But uh, primarily, um, the real-time aspect of these engines, these tools, allow you to find that perfect shot. You can go through 100 different view locations before you find that one that just really nails the space. Um, and then you can iterate on just that one view. Um, it also allows you to stage an entire space and look around. Uh, in the past, you would kind of say, I need a view looking out of window A, um, and that is going to be our view rendered. So as a traditional artist, I would go in, I would place elements to match that view, and then the client would come back and say, I kind of want to see option B looking the other direction. Well, now you have a situation where you have to turn the camera around, 
remodel everything and you know hope that that's the view that the client chooses um by doing it this way we stage the entire room and then we find a view and that gives us so much more control over what we show the client and it allows us so much more flexibility over how we communicate visually with the client it's 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 so much more effective a tool uh, in visual communication than anything else that I've used. That's fantastic. And uh, I think it's always good to leave on a note that makes uh, Enscape sound pretty good. So um, I think we'll end it there and say, Ted, this has been an incredible um, webinar here. Really seen some fantastic work. It's great to hear your tech stack and your workflow is pretty sophisticated and you're providing a fantastic service uh, to the industry. So I really appreciate it. And I well, would say to everyone in the me. audience, uh, thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, you know, uh, I appreciate being here, and uh, it's always fun to show off uh, a little bit of your work. So, absolutely, thanks. it's great to see it. Thanks, everybody. Take care.